On behalf of the entire NACTO team, I'd like to welcome you to Designing Cities 2018. <laughs> so recently, a friend of mine, I was at a party drinking my beer innocently, um, a friend of mine who works in criminal law asked me, Linda, is this the most exciting time ever in transportation? <laughs> and uh, I want to just say, looking at this crowd, I think the answer is yes. Um, I will say, I think he was thinking more about technology, um, from apps to e-scooters to autonomous vehicles. And I know that a lot of cities are struggling with that, and NACTO is struggling with that, because there's a lot of great stuff. There's some things that don't feel so right. We're still trying to find our way in that. Um, but to me, right now is a really great moment in transportation, where we can bring together the energy and resources from the private sector, um, with the public sector and together with our communities of people that we're trying to help out in our cities build those cities that we need um, with so many people working towards this vision of a new American city where everybody walks even in LA thank you hotel artist <laughs> we can we can make our cities the places where everyone can pursue their dreams um, and with that, I'd like to give special recognition um, to Ford uh, Motor Company. It's our diamond sponsor. You want to come up, John? Um, uh, they're supporting Designing Cities in 2018, and John Coleman is here um, to speak about uh, what Ford is doing in the mobility space and in their work with cities. Um, he is the Director of City Solutions for Ford Smart Mobility. Welcome, John. Thank you very much. Thank you. So. So, good afternoon. It is truly a pleasure to be here and help kick off this event. Um, as I was trying to think about how we could get everyone engaged in this, I happened to see a movie recently, uh, The Martian, some of you may have seen it, and there's a line from that that seemed really appropriate for this because there are an awful lot of people in the last couple of years that have looked at transportation and some of the challenges and said, we just need to science the shit out of this. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you, this conference isn't called Sciencing Cities. It's called Designing Cities, because at the core of it, although technology is an enabler, it is not the solution that we're going to get. The solutions have to be focused on people. People are at the center of why we're doing this. Enabling people to get to where they're productive, enabling people to get to education, to healthcare, to food, those types of things, and enabling goods to get to them, that's really what we're talking about. And whether you talk about it with shared streets or you talk about it with green streets or whatever your area of expertise is, at the core, almost everyone I know in this room recognizes the value of human beings at the center of what they do. And that's really why Ford is sponsoring this. And we have our entire City Solutions team will be out here in LA this week. So I encourage you, if you see someone with a blue oval, don't think that they're from the big, big you know, car company. We're from the City Solutions team. It's a startup within a 100-year-old company. And we're really good at building the metal box on wheels that moves people around. But we recognize that that isn't good enough anymore. But what we really need to do is understand the issues of access. How do we actually enable people to thrive and flourish on their own terms? So with that, that's all I have to say from Ford Motor Company up here. I encourage you to start conversations with us. If there's one thing we know more than anything else, it's that we don't have all the answers and we don't know anyone who has all the answers. But between us, we can have the dialogue and the discourse and the ability to actually change the way the world moves. And if we do that, I think we would all claim that this week has been a great success. So thank you very much and enjoy your week. Thank you, John and Ford for your leadership on these issues. Um, next up, you're gonna be hearing from Jeanette Seta Khan, the NACTO board chair and the principal of transportation of Bloomberg Associates. Um, I think Jeanette needs little introduction with this group for the most part, um, but I will say that she's been a tremendous mentor to me and to many other people in this room, and I hope you'll join me in welcoming Jeanette Seta Khan to the stage. Well, thank you, Linda, for your hard work and your leadership of NACTO. And a big thanks to Corinne Kisner, um, the Deputy Director of NACTO, and the conference Zarina for designing cities this year. 
Um, and she's had a great team in Alex Engel and uh, Sasha Berger, Sol uh, Celine Schmidt, and others. And they have done an, a, a tremendous job uh, in making today happen. So please join me in giving them all a great <laughs> hand of thanks. So welcome to NACTO 2018. Woo! The state of our union is strong. There are over 1,100 of you here today. We are a movement. We are a power. We are to be reckoned with. And whether it is, whether you're coming from Anchorage to Amsterdam, from Boston to Boise, from Cambridge to Culver City, from Detroit to Denver, from London to Las Vegas. I could keep going, you get the idea. But I'll stop there because I want you all to give a big hand to the 125 cities and transit agencies that are here today. That is so impressive. We have come a long way, baby, and it is amazing to see what is happening on our streets. Our cup literally runneth over with great policies and projects and programs since we last met in Chicago at Designing Cities last year. So I thought I'd give us a little bit uh, of a highlight reel from last year. Um, last year, our member cities created 41 public space projects, people places. Um, like here in Oakland, uh, is Oakland in the house? Oakland? Woo! Oakland, look at that thing of beauty there. Moving projects like this one in Fowler Square in Brooklyn, uh, a project we started um, with epoxy, gravel, and paint. And it's now been taken through final construction thanks to the unbelievable leadership of Polly Trottenberg and her team from New York City DOT. Polly, so great. And we've seen cities like Montreal tear down the Bonaventure Expressway and build Bonaventure Boulevard. Yes, you're getting the idea. And while many American cities see highways as their future, this is what the future of a real walkable city looks like. Instead of building walls to keep people out, they're tearing them down to let people in. And this work is playing out all over the world. This is Fortaleza in Brazil, which transformed side streets into people streets under the leadership of Sky Duncan and her amazing team at the Global Designing Cities Initiative. Sky Duncan. And Fabrizio is Fabrizio. And Abby and Ankita, stand up. Are you guys here? I can't even see you. Go find them. They're doing amazing work. And it's happening in places like Bogota, Bloomberg Associates, Nick Mascara, uh, Andy Wiley Schwartz, Seth Salamano. We worked with the GDCI team, changing spaces and places uh, in Bogota. And in Addis Ababa, you know, really painting the city that we want to see. You know, and it's incredible. You know, all of our projects go through very difficult moments, but you sometimes sort of forget, like, the ch different challenges in different cities. What you don't see next to this beautiful blue painting is the fact that there are actually little baby donkey hoof prints there because they didn't, we didn't stop the donkeys from going through at 3 a.m. in the morning. So, you know, <laughs> but you don't see that. You just got to keep rolling with the punches in this, uh, in this kind of work. You know, and in Milan, it's unbelievable to see what we were able to do in two weeks, turning... Uh, Milan, bringing that, na that NACTO gospel. Um, and when streets are designed to welcome people, people really welcome their streets. And the 349 miles of bike lanes that NACTO cities have built in the last year is a sign of intelligent design, if I've ever seen one. And NACTO and Bloomberg work together with Detroit, bringing over five miles of protected bike lanes to this uh, street on East Jefferson in Detroit. And it's part of this new network that puts uh, Detroit on the map. They've literally done the biggest one-year expansion uh, of bike lanes in, uh, in, the, in the history of North America. Anybody here from Detroit? Detroit. 
And Minneapolis, I know someone's here from Minneapolis. Woo! Minneapolis is, is literally planting its flag in the bike lane. And we're seeing new unbelievable designs uh, in Vancouver. It's really raising the bar to a completely different level. In Boston, somebody here from Boston? Joe? <laughs> El Paso. Yeah. Yeah. Philly. Woo! I love that they're sitting together. Portland. Making it weird in Portland. Yeah, laying it down. Austin, where they're really keeping it weird. Where's Rob? But it's not just bikes. You've also rolled out 25 miles of dedicated transit lanes in the last year, like here in Denver. Woo! And in New York. Woo! And Seattle. Here's Seattle over there. It's like the region, it's the, it's the map of the country here. Um, and also 2,200 safety projects implementing proven strategies to make our streets safer like here in Boston. And this work has been inspired by the NACDO design guidance and the NACDO staff who bring so much to make this urban revolution possible. And the Library of Congress has nothing on the NACDO archives because we just issued six new documents of proven policies and projects and programs from across the network so cities don't have to reinvent the wheel to do great work. And just 10 days ago, we saw the Global Street Design Guide published in both Portuguese and Mandarin. And now, yes, somebody, somebody there? <laughs> Bringing this guide now to more than 1.5 billion people served worldwide. You know, I sort of feel like it's like the McDonald's thing, but it's good for you. <laughs> and it's now being translated into Russian and Spanish. Uh, and so soon it will be accessible in languages that are spoken, spoken by 40% of the world's population. It's incredible work. You know, and it's also a two-way street. NACDO staff also learns from their close collaboration with all of you, whether it's on dockless bikes here in DC and some of the challenges that we face. You know a little bit about that. Um, but we have to be clear that the challenges that we face are not about dockless mobility and scooters. They're not just, they're not mobility problems that, they ha that we have, they are management problems that we have. And that's why the guide to shared active transportation, those guides are so important because they've got the details about permitting and about regulation and siting. And a big thank you to Kate Villanier and to Nicole Payne for their great work um, on this uh, guide. And some of the voices in this room right here have come, came together for three days to develop this new national guidance for managing and regulating new mobility options. And we're already seeing uh, solutions that kind of put dockless mobility in its place, you know, that adapts technology to our streets and not the other way around. And we've seen some great success uh, in the new transit guidance. Uh, and a big thanks to Matt and Aaron for that work. It's extraordinary especially in a year when transit is really under assault. And it's more important than ever to make transit count, um, which is what they're doing in Toronto and what Phil Washington is doing right here in Los Angeles. NACTO is also about building, of course, better streets, but also better transportation departments. And this spring, we released a playbook on how cities and transit agencies can work better together. Um, and you should look out for uh, Jenny O'Connell and Kate Fillinier to get some more details on this extraordinary piece of work. And we need to design streets that keep people moving, but we also need to design our processes to keep communities engaged and ensure that we're going beyond the usual suspects and hear all of the voices in our planning process. And designing our streets for people means all people of all ages and all abilities. Like the work San Jose is doing, building 30 miles of bike lanes for people of all ages and, and abilities. Anybody here from San Jose? 
San Jose, giving it up. And similar work is underway in Atlanta and Vancouver and Chicago and San Francisco. It has been an incredibly productive year. And it's also been a growing year. Um, we now have 63 cities and 11 transit agencies in the NACDO family. That's amazing. And we've got some new members, and I'm going to ask them to stand up and be counted and keep standing until we're, until we're done, so you can be here for a while. <laughs> Chicago Transit Authority, give it up for Chicago. <laughs> Cupertino. <laughs> Dallas. <laughs> Grand Rapids. <laughs> Harrisburg, keep standing. Houston Metro. Metro Transit in Minneapolis, Pasadena, Sacramento, St. Louis. Woo! Welcome to the family. Look at you with all these great projects. Look at them all. It is a great, happy family, and we are so happy to have you with us. We are, again, strong. And there is more exciting news on the horizon. Last year in Chicago, we released the first guidance for designing streets of the future. I'm sure most of you saw that from designing streets that, make, that account for speeding and safety to guidelines for coding the curb and managing the curb. And it's a vision for streets in this autonomous future. And we're on the cusp of releasing the second edition. And this one is going to have a big focus on pricing strategies so that we are ensuring that our roadways work for everyone and discourage unsafe and unsustainable single occupancy vehicle trips that could tear, literally tear our cities apart. A second focus is on freight management, one of the fastest growing drivers of traffic today. And you know, you think about the tripling that we're going to see of delivery vans on our streets and it's really daunting. And so we need to be able to deal with the UPSs and the Amazon vans and the drones and the sidewalk bots so that our streets don't crawl, uh, stop in a crawl. And it's not just about the hardware on our streets, it's also about the software on our streets. And we need to find ways to harness the digital deluge that we're all facing. And earlier this year, we launched Shared Streets, which is a new digital commons for digital uh, data sharing between companies and cities. And last week we uh, announced Shared Streets 2.0 and it is a the next generation platform with tools on how to solve and manage uh, some of the most difficult transportation challenges uh, that we face today. And it is the first of many public-private partnerships to come. Um, and we're giving cities access to the information that they need to better manage their streets safely um, so that you all are not planning blind. And first, uh, we're working with the city solutions team at four uh, to map out not just curb regulations, but actually um, real-time uh, curb demand for, for curb space so that we can reduce congestion, greenhouse gas uh, emissions, and cut down on conflicts. We've also formed a partnership, first ever partnership with Uber and Lyft. I know this is astonishing. I find myself, it's hard to believe that I'm at a Designing Cities conference praising Uber and Lyft and other TNCs, but they are coming to the table with aggregated and anonymized data, and um, it's been a great new um, cooperative partnership that we formed with them. And it, uh, we're also forming a partnership on sharing data on um, dangerous speeding, which is really important when we want to design streets so that we can prevent these injuries and fatalities before they happen. And it builds on work that we've done in Washington, D.C. Is Washington, D.C. in the house? Take a bow. That is some great work you are doing in Washington, D.C. And we'll be rolling it out uh, to more cities uh, to come. And so from a very simple idea creating this universal base map um, for cities and companies to work with, Shared Streets has grown into this a uh, larger roster of partners and building out a really new digital commons for uh, the public commons. And a big shout out to Kevin Webb at the Open Transport Partnership, Molly Pellon at NACDO, Nick Mascara at BA. Big hand for the great work that they are doing. 
on designing the streets of the future and making it possible for us to work together better. And speaking of the best, it's not just about digital infrastructure. Yeah, you see yourself there, I know. <laughs> see, we're building the leaders of the future, and they are standing up to be counted now. Because uh, we, we need to manage our human infrastructure. And people are the best infrastructure that we have. And I want all of the leaders of the Designing Cities Leadership Class 2018 to stand up and be counted right now. <laughs> Leadership NACTO. You're looking at the future right there. So great. Thank you. Woo. And speaking of the best in the business, let's have a huge shout out to our NACTO team. They are the best in the business, best jazz hands in the business to boot. So now I want to bring you back to LA and to thank Salida Reynolds, the general manager of LADOT, for her great leadership and her great work from expanding the network of bike lanes on Figueroa to shepherding Vision Zero through so that the city of angels sees fewer speed demons on its streets. It's clever, right? That was sent. <laughs> Nick, sorry, Nick. She's also got an awesome new strategic implementation plan, which you'll hear about later. But at the end of the day, it is about our streets. And to believe in the transformative power of our streets is to believe in the future of cities. And we need to keep our eyes on that street. And remember, we're designing it for everyone, including our most vulnerable users. And if we can design a street that works for everyone, the street that works for kids, that's what we need to do. And that's why the next edition of the NACTO Canon is dedicated to the next generation. Because a safe street doesn't just look safe, it doesn't have just have safe statistics. A safe street feels safe for kids and for parents. And when a street is safe for everyone, people come together. And you know that. Because you're the ones making the changes on the ground that we want to see. You are the ones that are fighting for better streets, not only for those today, but for those who follow. You are the ones that are building the road ahead that put people first. And thanks to you, our greatest cities are yet to come. And together, we will make that happen. Thank you. Yeah, you can come up. And now I'm happy to turn it over to the queen of LA Streets, the general manager of LA DOT, and your inspiring kick-ass NACTO president, Salida Reynolds. Thank you, Jeanette. That was fantastic. Welcome to LA, y'all. We're so happy you're here. Um, it has been a long journey for us to get to this day. It seems sort of fantastic and mystical that it's actually happening. Um, and we're in Los Angeles, so that's appropriate. A fair amount of, a little, a little dose of mysticism. Um, but first, before I, I do what I, what I came up here to do, um, I want to recognize all of the folks um, who made today happen uh, on the LA side. So first, um, LADOT, please stand up and all of our community partners who helped make this conference happen and who helped bring it together, um, who planned workshops and workshops who are gonna host you on, yeah, y'all all stand up. I'm talking about you, Dan Mitchell. I'm talking about you, Murdad. I'm talking about you, Deborah Murphy from LA Wax. Thank you. And I wanna give a special shout out to uh, Jennifer Cohen, Lily O'Brien, and Monique Earle, Assistant General Manager for LADOT, who really put in long hours um, to bring this together. Um, we are so excited to host y'all, and we're so happy you're here. You know, NACTO always comes um, at just the right time, uh, because these days, it is very difficult, no matter where you sit uh, on the political spectrum, it's very difficult not to feel overwhelmed and discouraged by what's happening in the world at large. 
But whenever I feel that way, the thing that brings me hope is to put my head down and do good work and get shit done in cities, which is what we do day in and day out. And so when we have everyone together uh, who does that, there's just a magic um, that is healing and that is powerful and that is a good reminder um, of, of the power we have when we come together. So I just, I'm up here right now actually because um, we have a very, very special ceremony planned for our leadership NACTO class. So one of the things that I cared a lot about when I became president was that I felt that um, the, a lot of NECTO's juju is peer-to-peer -peer sharing. And I felt strongly that I wanted to see us go down, double down on that, and develop the next generation of folks ready to step up into these incredibly difficult jobs um, to wield the power of running a city department of transportation. Um, I know when I stepped into that work, I needed all of the help and wisdom and coaching and mentoring I could get, and many of you in this room provided that for me. And so I'm so proud that uh, through the hard work of NACTO's staff, particularly Corinne Kisner, we were able to bring that program to life um, and see the first class of Leadership NACTO fellows here today. Um, it is so important that your leadership team in cities looks like the cities that you serve. And oftentimes in the public sector, we don't have the luxury of investing in leadership programs for our people, and we become frustrated because the pipeline seems empty. But let me tell you, the pipeline is not empty. The pipeline is robust, and it's fantastic, um, and I'm so excited to honor them today. So with that, where's Corinne? Oh, there you are. Um, when I call your name, please come up and get your inaugural Leadership NACTO pin. Uh, Brooke McKenna, Assistant Director for Street Management, City of Cambridge, Department of Traffic, Parking, and Transportation. <laughs> Janet Atarian, Deputy Director of the City of Detroit, Planning and Development. Justin Stewenberg, Vice President of Planning and Capital Projects with Indigo. Kelly Eman, Director of Complete Streets, Philadelphia Office of Transportation and Infrastructure Systems. Leah Mooney, Director of Strategic Planning and Policy from the Chicago Transit Authority. Marcel Porras, Chief Sustainability Officer, LADOT. Nicole Altmix, Executive Director for Transportation Planning and Management, New York City, DOT. Wen Yang, City Traffic Engineer, City of West Palm Beach. Victoria Wise, Chief of Staff, Sustainable Streets Division from SFMTA. And a couple of them who are not able to be here, but I'm going to give them shouts out. Anik Bode, Assistant Director of the Austin Transportation Department, and Ahmed Durat, Transportation Policy Advisor, City of Seattle, Mayor's Office. Congratulations. We're so proud of you. So, um, it's really cool to get a pen, that's awesome. But part of the reason why we tricked you into coming up here and giving you a pen is that the next uh, round of applications for this program are now open through December 10th. Uh, if you go to NACTO.org. So uh, they're all wearing these pins now. So if you are interested, you want to hear about their experience, you want to learn more, please find them and talk to them. Um, I have a feeling that each of them uh, has something really fantastic to share. Um, I was lucky enough to spend some time with them. And whether it's sort of inspiration that they got or they were in a moment of transpiration, trans transformation, <laughs> um, really the beauty up here is a about a, a new cohort of leaders that have each other to lean on, um, and that's one of the best things about the program. So thank you guys so much. So uh, the next thing I'm going to do is introduce um, one of my partners in crime, um, an amazing accomplice that I've been able to learn from and be honored to work next to, uh, Phil Washington. And you can read Phil's bona fides. He's the CEO of Metro. He's doing amazing things and has an amazing uh, track record behind him. But some of the things that I know about Phil from working with him um, are that uh, he likes jazz, but not music musicals. Um, he hustles hard on the largest capital program in North America, but you will not catch him breaking a sweat on a bike. Um, Phil and I share a philosophy that investing in people is the pathway to success. And really that we lead our people best when we approach leadership with an attitude of service and gratitude. 
Um, I'm very inspired to watch what Phil is building. Yes, he's building a subway system, but he is very intentionally wielding that and using that to build wealth in the communities through which that subway system passes and to make sure that Metro's legacy transforms the communities in a positive way um, and, and really a, a very special way. So please join me in welcoming Phil Washington. Well, thank you so much, Salita. It's always tough to follow Salita Reynolds. Uh, and let me just clarify riding a bike thing. <laughs> I, I, I have no problem riding a bike. I just don't ride a bike in a suit. That's all. I mean, you know, I don't like to sweat when I get to work. I mean, so, um, so I just want to clarify that because I'm not a bike hater or anything like that. <laughs> Listen, let me just thank all of you for the work that you do. Uh, when we talk about designing cities, really redesigning cities, right? That's, that's kind of what we're talking about doing, redesigning cities. And so the work that you are doing uh, is appreciated. Uh, I understand the challenges that come with that. Uh, quite honestly, we are in a battle between good and evil. Uh, when we talk about designing, redesigning our cities uh, so that um, seniors uh, from 80 to kids that are eight um, can live in our cities and be able to use our streets. So thank you so much for your work. Um, it's always good to begin with a quick overview. Lots of people in this county, uh, eight 0.1 registered vehicles in LA County. And I, I mean, for the sixth straight year, this is the congested, the congestion capital of the world. Six straight years. Because you could actually drive a city forever, or drive a car forever in this city. There's no snow, there's no salt on the ground. You know, you know it's not like Chicago, my hometown, or New York. Uh, where, you know, you may have a hole in the floorboard or whatever. Uh, you, you could probably get away with driving uh, a hoopty out here uh, forever. So a lot of cars out here, a lot more people coming uh, to this county, uh, and it is a big county, right? This is a, I mean, this is really, really big. <laughs> really, really big. I mean, this is... I think uh, the county by itself, just the county, is larger than something like 42 states. Uh, you know, California, I believe, the last time I looked, has the sixth largest economy in the world. Fifth. Fifth. Okay, somebody. All right. <laughs> NACTO. It's all these smart people at NACTO. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, this is a really, really big county. This is a view from a satellite from NASA. It's incredible. LA Metro, big agency, third largest transit system in the US. Uh, somebody mentioned Polly Trottenberg. Is Polly Trottenberg here? OK, she's not here. Oh, there she is. Uh, we have the largest transportation expansion program in the country. Every time I mention that, Charlie says, no, it's New York. New York has, but Polly knows that. She, Polly knows I love her. So, um, but we, the reason I mentioned Polly uh, is that we're the third largest transportation agency in the US, uh, but I predict in the next 10 to 15 years, we're gonna surpass New York in terms of transit. With, with the build out that we have coming, uh, and I'll talk about Measure M in a minute, um, but as we build out these great capital programs, uh, it's gonna be important uh, that we build them well, uh, that we do a good job in designing them along with the streets, uh, but I see us overtaking Chicago and New York uh, as uh, the busiest transit system in the U.S. We have lots of employees, 
about 1.2, 1.3 million rides a day, lots of buses, lots of freeway uh, HOV lanes. We have a unique role uh, at LA Metro in that we are operator, builder, funder, uh, planner, transportation funding flow uh, through us, uh, which really allows us to take on a leadership role and help really coordinate mobility programs throughout the county. Uh, I spoke to NACTO last year in Chicago, uh, and it was a great conference uh, last year as well, just like this one. I talked a little bit about Measure M. Uh, Measure M, uh, a new half cent sales tax uh, approved by 71% of uh, LA County voters in 2016, the most uh, ambitious and comprehensive voter approved transportation program in America. What we're talking about is building 40 uh, major highway trans and transit projects over the next 40 years. Uh, we have uh, pushed forward what we call a 28 by 2028 initiative uh, to build 28 projects in the next 10 years in time for the 2028 Olympic Games. Uh, and this 28 by 28 effort, I think, is probably the most ambitious endeavor within that Measure M framework uh, that has been uh, tried in this country. Uh, this transportation plan, lots of components. Uh, as you can see here, we have a local return uh, piece, which we're saying we will give money back to the 88 cities in this county so they can fix their streets and their potholes uh, and redesign the cities that make up this county. Uh, there's 35 percent uh, of that half cent sales tax that is dedicated to transit projects. Um, there is uh, money there for highway improvements. Uh, there is money there to keep fares affordable uh, for seniors uh, and students and the disabled. Uh, there is money, much needed money there for state of good repair because we recognize that we cannot build it and not take care of it. Uh, it's just like your car. You wouldn't buy a car and never change the oil in it. Uh, some of you might do that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we recognize that state of good repair uh, is very important. And so as we implement uh, this great plan, uh, we introduced in this county sort of a five-point plan that really gives us the opportunity and positions us uh, to be the transportation center of excellence. Let me quickly go through that five-point plan that's going to help us get there. The first is implementing mobility innovation. Uh, how can we provide high-quality options that enable people to spend less time traveling? And so what we have said that we want to partner with the private sector. And so we've gone about the business of talking to the private sector, challenging uh, the private sector, uh, really reinstituting our uh, unsolicited proposal policies. Uh, we created an office of what I call extraordinary innovation. We have uh, received and evaluating uh, over 100 unsolicited proposals that we've received for small projects, for large projects, for mega projects. Uh, as a result, some of those proposals we're pursuing are P3s or public-private partnerships on many, uh, at least two or three of our major construction projects. Uh, we are moving forward with our micro transit or on-demand bus service pilot program to help people travel in communities and more easily bridge first and last miles. The second big point is capturing the hearts and minds of people. The auto industry has done it well. I know we have Ford here. They have the beautiful people, you know, uh, Matthew McConaughey, you know, hair. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's blowing in the wind, and, uh, and I cannot compete with that. <laughs> but how do we capture the hearts and minds of people? 
Uh, how can we deliver outstanding trip experiences for our riders and our customers? And so our Vision 2028, which is our new strategic plan for the next decade, really puts customer, the customer experience at the core of everything we do. We've seen a drop in ridership like other uh, agencies. Uh, what we have said, though, uh, is that we intend to go out and reclaim those riders, uh, retain current riders, and recruit new riders. We're reimagining our bus service. Uh, and like most transit agencies that tweak their service on the street two or three times a year, what we're saying is we are going to go out and look at all of our routes, everything that's on the street. Nothing is sacred. We know that there have been changes in employment centers. We know that there have been different uh, uh, residential areas and employment centers that have popped up. We need to look at our entire system, and we're doing that through what we call our next-gen bus study. We're looking at security. Uh, we have partnered uh, with LAPD, uh, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, the Long Beach Police Department. We have homeless outreach teams uh, on our system. Uh, we have a homelessness challenge here uh, in the county. We can't arrest our way out of the homelessness challenge. Um, we have to engage the homeless. We have put uh, outreach teams uh, out there to look to see how we can help uh, with people that need assistance and those teams are all over our system. Uh, crime has gone down on our system. We have uh, major and very visible uh, marketing campaigns underway to reduce sexual harassment on our system and improve rider etiquette. So this idea of capturing the hearts and minds of the people uh, also includes uh, doing things like charging stations at our various stations, free Wi-Fi, uh, interactive tablets to search for community information, the ability to make uh, free phone calls right from the panels on our digital kiosks. This capturing the hearts and minds of the, of the people uh, will be in a new campaign that we're launching soon to explain exactly uh, why we must improve mobility and why it's really all about uh, the quality of life and time to do things that counts. Our third point is embracing equity. Uh, the idea uh, that we want to enhance communities and lives through mobility and access to opportunity. Um, we are looking through the lens of equity uh, when we plan projects, uh, when we build projects, we're looking through that lens uh, to address the issue uh, of equity in infrastructure. Uh, this whole idea of embracing equity, our board approved what we call an equity platform that looks to define and measure, looks to listen and learn, focus and deliver, train and grow. So these four pillars of our equity platform are very, very real. Uh, as we look to embrace equity, we look at the transit-oriented communities, uh, and we look to uh, do what we can to prevent displacement uh, and gentrification. We understand that we do not control uh, all of that, but we can instigate uh, and we can agitate uh, and we can influence, and that is what we look to do. Uh, embracing equity means looking at the workforce of the future with a career pathway. We have put together an infrastructure career pathway, sort of a cradle to grave uh, idea to look, to see how we can develop right now a transportation school grades 6 to 12. Uh, we have kicked this off already. We're in the process of partnering with the County of Los Angeles. Uh, this cradle-to-grave approach uh, says that we will start with young people. We will begin uh, teaching uh, infrastructure. We will begin talking to kids about design bill in grade school. We will begin talking to kids about the P3 delivery model. Uh, we will begin to 
uh, talk to kids as early as the sixth grade about the redesign of cities, which Necto is heavily involved with. This is a cradle to grave career pathway with the transportation school being the cradle uh, and the grave being the CEO position. <laughs> uh, we are looking at embracing and, and developing programs to help our military veterans uh, who return home. How does their military occupational specialty skills translate to infrastructure and transportation infrastructure? And I can speak to that as a uh, retired United States Army soldier. We want women and girls to know uh, that they can work in this field. Uh, we've started a women and girls council at Metro to see how we can set women and girls on a path uh, to careers. We're studying uh, the idea of how women travel. Uh, we want to design our system uh, because we understand uh, women and young mothers have to drop their kids off at daycare, all of those kinds of things. We want to think about that as we design our cities. We're reviewing our job descriptions. Uh, there was a job description uh, that we had on the books that required the lifting of 80 pounds and the institutional bias that was there to keep women out from that particular job, we removed that 80 pound requirement. Because we don't need it. I don't even know if we have guys there that lift 80 pounds. Uh, the fourth big point is this idea of fostering continuous improvement. Uh, making all this happen starts with being responsive, accountable, trustworthy, uh, best practices as our guiding principles. We're being good stewards of the transportation dollars. Uh, we don't take for granted the trust the public has given through us through our local sales tax investments. Uh, this idea of leveling the playing field for small businesses is very, very real for us. Uh, we asked uh, an assembly member uh, in the California State House to carry a bill for us to create a medium-sized business program. Uh, when folks graduate from the DBE or the small business program now, uh, they have a place to go in terms of medium-sized packages. Uh, we have said that instead of small and minority and women-owned and veteran-owned businesses uh, being subs all the time, why can't they be primes and have the traditional prime sub to them? That is what we're talking about. Uh, this idea of making sure that all 11,000 of our employees believe that individual roles all contribute to our model. Uh, Salita talked about I love jazz, I do love jazz. And the beauty of it is uh, everybody's doing their thing playing jazz, but it sounds good. Somehow everybody's in sequence. That's great music. And so having everyone in the same sync is very important in this county. The fifth and final point is stepping into leadership voids. Uh, transforming transportation in LA County is happening through a sort of a regional uh, collaboration and bold leadership. Uh, stepping into these leadership voids. Uh, while our mission is better transportation, we know that. Uh, stepping in, into these leadership voids in a number of areas are very important, whether it be homelessness, uh, whether it be um, all aspects of bettering people's lives, we can influence, impact, and instigate. Uh, stepping into these leadership voids means uh, the massive redevelopment of Los Angeles Union Station, the transportation hub, uh, partnering with the state of California on California high-speed rail. Uh, one of our goals in stepping into this leadership void uh, is looking to stand up a full-blown uh, passenger rail manufacturing facility right here in LA County. Uh, we believe that the benefits that come with that uh, manufacturing and suppliers, 
uh, being right here in LA County fits very, very well in our discussion uh, of being the transportation center of excellence. This is really about taking calculated risk. Uh, Measure M, ha new half cent sales tax, we were bold enough to say that it should have no sunset. This half cent tax should not end because transportation is an ongoing need. Now, we would not think of stopping funding for education. Uh, we should think the same way about transportation. In implementing this great program, this is nothing short uh, of really stepping into those leadership voids uh, that I talked about. So let me end uh, just by saying that um, we believe that we can leave an infrastructure inheritance for our children. Uh, Measure M is just that. Um, we've been on a infrastructure vacation in this country for the last three or four decades. Uh, we are dedicated to the idea of bringing an end to that infrastructure vacation, at least here in LA County, and that is what we plan to do. But I'll say that leadership in this infrastructure space is hard. Uh, and, and as you as leaders know, you know leadership itself uh, is dangerous. It's actually dangerous. Can we do all these things and survive? Can we make those tough choices in leading transportation uh, authorities and agencies and you in various cities, can we do those things and survive? I would argue that we must. Uh, we must be able to lead, we must be able uh, to think big, and we must be able to think beyond our current circumstance. So thank you for having me here, and my hope is that the conference uh, is a good one here in Los Angeles, spent a lot of money, we got the sales tax coming in, <laughs> and we want you to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. You can see we're so lucky to have Phil's leadership here in LA County. Good afternoon, my name is Kate White. I am Deputy Secretary at the California State Transportation Agency. Greetings from the California Secretary's Office for Transportation. And I have uh, the distinct uh, privilege of introducing our new uh, California Department of Transportation Director. Um, but before I do that, I was thinking back, Salita, to 2014, the last time NACJO was in California. And we had, a, had coffee, we, both of us were sort of newish in our jobs, and we said, you know, we really need a network of California uh, NACDO cities. And thus, I believe, as when CACTO was born. Cacti, now it's cacti, affectionately known as cacti. So um, that has been a wonderful opportunity on a monthly basis for the uh, cacto uh, cities, um, cacti cities to uh, have a dialogue with the state on how we can continue to transform our state transportation agencies and departments. Um, so uh, I'm, it's my pleasure to introduce Director Lori Berman. Um, Lori was uh, appointed by the Governor Jerry Brown to serve as the Caltrans Director this March, and she was confirmed by the Senate in July. And over the past few months, Lori has spearheaded Caltrans efforts to successfully implement our new landmark transportation law, Senate Bill 1, the Road Repair and Accountability Act of 2017, which is going to generate $54 billion over the next 10 years, matching a lot of uh, Measure M and many other local uh, sales tax measures, split between state and local partners. And it's gonna allow us to uh, really catch up on the deferred maintenance that Phil was uh, talking about and really invest in transforming California. Lori has had a long and distinguished career in California and in state service. She started with Caltrans in 1983 as a junior civil engineer. Um, and in, from 2009 to 2017, um, Lori served as the Caltrans director in the uh, San Diego district, where she really a hallmark of her leadership was collaborating with local partners to improve the economy, quality of life for people in California. 
Um, as the Caltrans district director, she fostered a series of cooperative relationships um, between her district and the regional entities and cities to really, that's really served as a model for the rest of the state. She also has had a leadership role in the Caltrans Improvement Project to modernize our state Department of Transportation. And uh, in 2012, then uh, director Malcolm Dougherty had asked her to come to Sacramento and really help us lead a comprehensive review of the department's business practices, ask questions internally, externally, how can we uh, move forward? How should a future State Department of Transportation function in the new world with 21st century challenges and opportunities? And so she worked with SSTI, with Caltrans' own employees to envision what a better Caltrans would be. And through this effort, Caltrans has adopted a new mission, a new vision and goals, developed our new strategic management plan, set new objectives, defined new performance measures. And Caltrans, as Caltrans director, she has continued to embrace innovation, continuous improvement, and strategic change to meet our challenges for the future. And finally, those of you who um, have known or worked with Lori, you know that safety has always been and will continue to be her highest priority. So no matter what Caltrans is involved with, whether it's construction to deliver some of those SB1, Senate Bill 1 improvements for major bike ped upgrades or operating our state highway systems in the, in the face of wildfires, um, Lori prioritizes safety of the public. Um, and she's committed to forging uh, partnerships at every level of government, including with cities, to make sure we have a multi-pronged effort that includes engineering, enforcement, edu education, all the ease that you know so well, to significantly reduce fatalities and serious injuries on our roads. So in closing, I'd like to welcome you to California and thank the organizers for the event, thank NACTO, and it's my privilege to introduce Caltrans Director Lori Berman. Oh, that was really nice, Kate, thank you. So you've been welcome to NACTO, you've been welcome to Los Angeles, and you've, you've been welcome to California, but I also, alongside Kate White, um, want to, again, on behalf of the state, wish say welcome to California. Um, it's great having people from all over the country here. It's a great state. LA is a really good city. I, I'm sure you're gonna get out and get to see some of the best that, that we have here. As director of the California Department of Transportation, I oversee an agency that owns and operates California State Highway System, more than 50,000 lane miles, over 13,000 structures, 43 tunnels and tubes, and two ferry boats. The State Highway System includes the highways and also key city streets, such as here in the LA area, Lincoln Boulevard and Santa Monica, as well as the Pacific Coast Highway that runs along our scenic coastline from north of the Bay Area to Orange County. We have about 18,000 Caltrans employees who keep this system running, and this system is supporting the world's fifth largest economy, and a population of 39 million people. You know what, Phil, it was the sixth largest until recently, so you're good. Um, <laughs> but when it got to be the fifth, we really took notice. Um, so we have a population of 39 million people, and that's projected to grow to 50 million by 2050. All these people need to move around the state, and that's our job, is to work with our local partners to make sure that's happening. We have a big ship to turn, but we are in a new era. Much of our transportation infrastructure is reaching the end of its design life, and at the same, ti at the same time that rapid innovation is coming to our sector. Transportation agencies are working overtime to maintain our system at the same time that the public expects more from us, that we will be more than good stewards of the highway system, but also support new on-demand travel options, make cities and, and neighborhoods more walkable and livable, all while improving the health, safety, equity, and the environment with every project. This new era requires that we reduce greenhouse gas emissions to stave off future climate changes, while we are already spending billions each year to protect from wildfire, wildfires and repair storm damage created by the climate effects that we are experiencing right now today. To reflect, to reflect these challenges, Caltrans adopted this new mission in 2014, provide a safe, 
sustainable, integrated, and efficient transportation system to enhance California's economy and livability. It's a mouthful, but it means a lot. And it's a fundamental shift from the previous version, which was Caltrans improves mobility across California. And I think that it was really important that as we were modernizing Caltrans that we updated our, our vision statement and our mission statement because the new vision statement talks about not just what good transportation is, but why it matters. And that's been really important internally for our employees to really feel like we are part of improving communities. And I think it's been very important externally for the general public to understand that good transportation is going to build good communities. The change demonstrates heightened awareness that the transportation system and our role in managing it have become more complex. As Kate mentioned, Senate Bill 1, our new transportation investment law, is enabling us to be better stewards of the transportation system and to invest in transformative multimodal projects. With SB1 funding, we are delivering hundreds of additional projects this year while also providing the people of California a myriad of benefits they've come to expect from transportation pro projects. Excuse me, I lost my space here. Um, in our mission statement, safe comes first because safety is our top priority, and as Kate mentioned, it's my top priority as director as well. Safety comes first for the Caltrans workforce, so we always as ask drivers, if you're driving through a work zone, whether on the state highway or on a local road, please slow down and pay attention, make sure everybody gets where they need to be safely. As part of our commitment to the safety of all road users, we have adopted towards zero deaths as our statewide safety goal. We are aggressively working with Vision Zero cities in California to prioritize reducing fatalities and ser serious injuries and to improve safety for everyone on our roadways, no matter how they travel. Specifically, we have significantly increased our commitment to pedestrian and bicycle safety this year. California's cities are at the forefront of transforming the transportation system, joining urban innovators like all of you all over the nation and the world. Together, we are confronting changing expectations from the people and communities we serve, explosive growth in transportation and digital technology, and challenges to the priorities that guide our work. Increasing emphasis on social equity, on public health, on climate mitigation and resilience, and on making streets that contribute to a vibrant public realm that we think and act differently, demands that we think and act differently. We are fortunate that California's cities are our proving grounds and our partners. And my thanks go in particular to the group of California NACTO members who have been meeting regularly this year with senior members of the California State Transportation Agency, the California Highway Patrol, and Caltrans, and working with us on issues that affect our collective success. In closing, I want to highlight four brand new Caltrans initiatives that I think will be of particular interest to you. Each of these aligns with NACTO's mission and with the Cal Caltrans sustainable priority to champion active transportation. We have just kicked off developing active transportation plans for the entire state highway system. In each of the department's 12 districts, Caltrans staff will work with a consultant team and with local partners to take an inventory of our system and identify priority corridors for pedestrian and bicycle facilities, safety improvements, and connectivity to local networks. We'll pay particular attention to the historic impacts that some freeway facilities have had in severing local connections, especially in disadvantaged communities, looking for opportunities to improve and create new links. The plans will benefit from Caltrans Big Data pilot project with Streetlight Data. Big Data is lo location-based smartphone app data from millions of users, and Caltrans is the first state DOT in the nation to contract with Streetlight Data to develop a pedestrian and bicycle volume data platform and purchase access to the data for our whole state system. This data has the potential to revolutionize bike and pedestrian planning by providing travel information everywhere on our system in nearly real time. And we'll be able to share that data with our partners. We're very excited about this, so stay tuned, and I'm sure we'll have more on that in the future. Planning is important, but Caltrans and all DOTs need to get it right in design and delivery of our bike, walk, and transit projects. We want to get better at this all over the state, so I am delighted to announce the launch this fall 
of the Caltrans Complete Street Center of Excellence. A first of its kind DOT initiative, the center aims to elevate skill levels and awareness of best practices in Complete Streets project implementation through a group of expert senior level staff that will serve as a technical resource to other Caltrans staff and through targeted training opportunities. The Center of Excellence will launch with assistance from our partners at Smart Growth America. Finally, we are expanding and strengthening our external partnerships in many meaningful ways, which is another one of my priorities as director. We have invited a diverse group of city engineers and planners, consultant partners, and advocates from across the state to serve on a new walk and bike technical advisory committee. This new committee will work hand in hand with Caltrans staff providing technical input as we develop new design guidance and deliver new projects with a focus on facilities that meet the needs of people of all ages and abilities. I hope you can tell we have an ambitious agenda and a serious commitment to being champions of active transportation. There's lots more to talk about and lots for us to learn, so I encourage you to connect with the Caltrans staff during and after the conference. And I encourage you further to continue to be innovators, examples, and champions of urban transportation that supports the economy and livability of your communities and your states. Thank you so much to the organizers and host committee for allowing me to share the stage today with a nice, such a great group of people and transportation leaders. Thank you. All right, it's my turn to bring it on home. So um, I wanted to take a minute while we're all here together before we embark on the next three days of really learning and working with each other um, to take a deep breath and think about uh, something that keeps me up at night, which is that over and over again, I see this divide occurring between urbanists and technologists. And I want to talk a little bit about how the time for that has to be passed and that it's time for all of us to lean into a new challenge. So running a Department of Transportation or working in a Department of Transportation can feel like this. Um, I wish my office was this cool and it was this easy to get it all in one place. Um, but the day-to-day -day sort of uh, the, the challenges that we face, whether it's the existential crisis around climate change or homelessness or housing, um, is significant. And it is easy to uh, focus on the day-to-day. But at LEDOT, we have set a vision to put us on a course to guide our decision making as we think about and look to the future. And I want to draw your attention to two words here. One word is the word everyone. We are very intentionally trying to tackle racial and socioeconomic equity in the way that we make investments on the street and the way we speak to and talk with and, and partner with and accomplice with communities around our city that have been historically underinvested in. The second word is dignity. So when you look around Los Angeles or the public realm in a lot of cities, it doesn't treat people with dignity. And people rise to the level of dignity that you provide them, whether it's in the way you show up with respect and humility in their community to talk about what they need, or if it's in the way that you design and deliver the things in your capital program. Our transportation system was set up to buy and runs pretty well for you if you are a nine to five white collar worker, but it fails vast majority of folks in our cities and it's time for that to change. But we are in the middle of a historic moment of transformation, digital transformation and disruption. And so while we and each in our individual cities contemplate how to wrangle with this, it's worth thinking about how we got here and what happened the last time around. So in 1880, Carl Benz patented the internal combustion engine, and the American wheelman went to Rhode Island to advocate for cities to start paving their streets to help people get around on bikes a little bit easier. By the 1910s, cities were not so worried anymore about horse manure as a design feature of streets uh, with horse-drawn carriages, but they were hearing from other voices, the American Automobile Club and auto manufacturers among them, advocating for the installation of traffic control devices on streets like stop signs and pavement markings that remain the language of infrastructure that we speak in cities today. 
By the 20s, the rise of the term jaywalking to criminalize walking had really come into prominence, and Los Angeles was the first city that made this a crime, that really made it so that you couldn't cross the street and use the public right-of-way at will any longer in order to organize our streets around mainly cars. And by the 30s, LA had started building our first freeways. We had begun to create this new network of infrastructure to allow for unfettered freedom for what we thought and felt at the time was progress and technology. And we were excited to be the city of the future. But by the 1960s, when we dismantled our last streetcar, we looked around at a city that had been torn apart by decisions to lay out infrastructure, um, sort of ignorant of the communities through which it passed. And you can see the legacy of institutional racism in the way neighborhoods and communities in this picture are walled off from opportunity by one, two, three, four, five different freeways in some cases. By the 70s, when the USDOT began writing the rule book for how, how everyone in this country designed their streets, Los Angeles took a look around and was having second thoughts about what we had done and what it had wrought. And we were thinking about bringing back our transit system because our city of villages had begun to sort of grind to a halt. But by the 2000s, a couple of things happened. One was that in around 2008, New York City DOT under Commissioner Jeanette Sadiq Khan's leadership set off a bomb uh, when they built the first parking protected bike lane in the United States. And then NACTO gave us all a recipe book for how to build our own bombs in our own cities to take back streets as public spaces. And cities began to rise to say, your design guides don't work for us because we need our streets to do more than just move as many cars as fast as possible. But the other thing that happened in this decade was the advent of the smartphone. And while we were excited and we welcomed it and it connected us in ways we had never been connected before, it also had some unintended consequences. It created a platform for brand new business models um, that we are seeing rise in cities today. So as we think about the pressure we are under to reshape our cities around this new technology, let's ask ourselves, how'd that go for us the last time around? Right? Because while Phil told you Los Angeles experiences more than 100 hours of congestion on an annual basis, there are some other things that we experience. In LA, you can get to 12 times as many jobs in an hour by car as you can in an hour by transit. You have to have a car in this city if you want to keep your family from falling into poverty or if you want to have true economic mobility. That's the system we've built. And it's drowning us because cars take up our most precious resource in cities, which is space. And if we want to keep growing and thriving, we have to be more thoughtful about the means to wealth in this city. There are other externalities that are intangible and tragic. The number one cause of death for kids in LA County, preventable death, um, is traffic crashes. And as hard as we work to take a systems approach to redesigning our streets, we know that the number one thing people have to do is drive less. So what's going to change for us this time around? I would argue that what's going to change for us is that as cities, we must come to the table and insist that just because the technology is changing doesn't mean our policies are. So I think there are four ways in which it could go different for us this time around. A lot of y'all have probably seen these kinds of images that come out of auto manufacturers and AV stacks and software companies. And all of this is done really from a windshield perspective, where the vehicle itself doesn't need infrastructure in order to operate. But whenever I see an image like that, I ask myself, where are the people, y'all? Because people are not data points that are predictable. And our infrastructure facilitates and manages a complex and delightful and thriving ecosystem that is almost impossible to write software around because the edge cases are endless. Our infrastructure is essential in making sure that this next technology revolution doesn't get us negative outcomes. So I think that looks a little bit like this. First, 
We need new maps and new ways of thinking about our cities in the digital realm as well as the physical realm. We must continue to double down on building the infrastructure that we always have, but now we need to map and create a new layer of digital infrastructure that extends 500 feet up into the sky and down to the sidewalk in front of the house in which you live. The pressure from all of these fleets on our infrastructure has gotten to the point where chaos is overtaking order and nobody is winning. Because the language we use to speak to these human drivers, whether it's the color of the curb or the traffic signal or the stop sign, is not going to be sufficient for the autonomous fleets of the future. And we're already seeing these things show up in our cities in a way that isn't necessarily meeting all of our goals. Because it doesn't matter if it looks like this, or it looks like this, or this, or God knows what that is, or this, or this, right? What matters is this. Because what's changed is that private mobility companies are showing up in the app store on our phones. Oh, look at that. It's a friendly neighborhood robot. But also on the app store of our city streets. We must begin to think of ourselves more like the App Store and write the rules in the playbook that expresses our policies through technology. Because when the robots multiply, oh, that robot may take me to the metro station, that's awesome, but now there's 400 of them. Um, they are all speaking to each other. And they are speaking a language we don't speak yet. And they're speaking to the mothership. And they are creating a map of our cities. And we are being cut out of our role of managing them as they move around. So what does it look like if we change that? What does it look like if we build on top of the incredible, powerful work of shared streets and create an operating and management system for cities where with an eye in the sky perspective on everything that happens in a thriving city, the hundreds of different events, as predictable as the Oscars, as unpredictable as a giant sinkhole opening up in the front of UCLA, or a First Amendment event, all of them come through the city, and we are the ones that manage and operate them. What if in the future we have the ability to create and open and close streets and curbs with the flip of a switch instead of with cones and personnel and tremendous time and effort and energy? That's what's possible if we start to think not just in terms of RFPs and RFIs, but in terms of APIs. So the second thing we must insist upon is a new definition of safety. This is a chart showing the rise in commercial aviation and the uh, amazing drop in the number of fatal crashes that happen in the sky. And why does this happen? In 2017, zero deaths in the sky. It's because safety is not a competitive feature. You don't buy a ticket on JetBlue because it has a five-star crash rating and it's the safest airline in the sky. You buy that because in the 60s and 70s, the Federal Aviation Administration remade itself for pilots and by pilots to usher in the jet age and make sure that safety was a shared responsibility. So when the tragedy happened earlier this year, when the hole breached on that Southwest flight, within 24 hours, they understood from a systems perspective why that happened. Within 48 hours, Every plane in the domestic fleet had been examined for the same deficiency, and within 72 hours, every plane in the global fleet had been examined for that same deficiency because the airlines share information. But on the ground, it doesn't look like that. And there's no reason to think that if cities are not at the table insisting that it looks like that, that the arrival of autonomy will have the safety outcomes um, that we all hope for. So how do we get there in terms of, of uh, the seat that we sit in in the city? How do we act more like a product company and invite in innovation on top of a platform? In Los Angeles, we have a very ambitious goal that in 10 years' times for the 28 Paralympic and Olympic Games, we will be the model city for autonomous movement. There are hundreds of products and services required to come into being to make that happen. And the city ought to be the one nudging and being the activist investor to make sure those things get the outcomes that we want. Because the way innovation happens now in cities is very closed. 
There's a small audience of folks innovating inside cities because of outdated procurement models and all kinds of other things. But I would argue that we have to explode the ecosystem of folks. Cities must own the APIs and own the data, but we must incentivize developers and other folks to come in and build the things that we want. And the most important part of this is that we have to redefine success. So uh, in 2008, there were some artists who talked to a bunch of uh, brainy San Francisco transportation people and asked them, money, politics, feasibility, no object. What is the future of transportation? And after we had solved the second Transbay tube um, and hung a bike and ped uh, path off of the Bay Bridge all the way from San Francisco to the east side, um, we came up with ideas like this where you can jump into a parachute uh, at the Embarcadero Ferry Building, zip across the bay on the Z Line, and land in Jack London Square, where you can take a roller coaster up to Coit Tower or an elephant ride in Dolores Park or an aerial tramway uh, over Pacific Heights. This is a reminder that mobility and transportation ought to be generous and fun. It ought to be enjoyable to get around your city, and we have lost that. But there is a, an opportunity to bring it back. So at LADOT, we've defined something we call transportation happiness, which is not something that most people associate with getting around LA right now, fine. But in order to change that, we have to know where we want to go. So we went out and asked stakeholders and people who work in transportation, what are the things that the mobility system in LA must deliver? Yes, safety and comfort. Yes, accessibility. Yes, reliability. But it also must deliver equity, and it must deliver culture and community. It must value and respect the communities through which we pass with our projects so that they are not communities to get through, but communities to get to, and that the investments that we make rest on data and focus on places um, that have, have the most to gain um, in the new sort of mobility revolution. We've created this mobility bill of rights and we're starting to test it out and decide if this is something that we could measure and live by and furthermore, hold people accountable to. When they want to come into our app store in Los Angeles, our terms and conditions are around things like safety and equity, um, sustainability, uh, freedom from harm, and all of these things that we've listed. Because the powerful outcomes we could get are to take a street like this, our iconic People Street program in front of the Vision Theater in South LA, and do this at scale in in through the entire city um, at the flip of a switch. That we can take our box of play and deliver play streets and, and opportunities for play and activity in communities that don't have access to open space. So I would say uh, it is time for urbanists to lean in to technology, to wield it and to leverage it to get to the outcomes that we want, and to make sure that what we do is inspiring all of the transportation technologists and urbanists and dreamers of tomorrow. Thank you very much. <laughs>